This episode is sponsored by Skillshare. Hey guys, Culture here. Today we're talking about... Sex, baby! Woohoo! I mean, kind of, but don't get so excited. We're talking about Freudian psychology. More specifically, how Freud describes human personalities, and, yes, how our sexual development impacts who we are. Of course, we should warn everyone ahead of time what that means. Crash? The following episode is a serious discussion of sex and psychology. You can expect boobs and brains, genitals and guilt, penis envy and parental pedantry. Viewer discretion is advised. Thank you. Sigmund Freud is the most famous psychologist to have ever lived. So naturally, we assume that he must be some kind of genius. But the truth is actually a little more complicated than that. Not as complicated as being in love with your mum, but still pretty complicated. Ah, uh, what did you just say? Ah, yes, well, that was one of Freud's most infamous theories, which we'll cover later. But you see my point. Freud's personality theories were scandalous and scintillating, which drew the attention of not only his peers, but the public too. Who doesn't love to hear that the reasons we are the way we are might be naughty or taboo? After all, sex sells. You're telling me. Hell, I'm only one step away from making my own OnlyFans. Or in your case, lonely fans. Freud's theories were outlandish, but the points he put forward led to many elements of psychology which we take for granted nowadays. The idea of unconscious thoughts affecting your actions, the effect your development can have on your adult personality, and so on. Perhaps the most prevalent personality theory Freud put forward was that of the three aspects of a person's personality. The id, the ego, and the superego. Oh my god, is that how you pronounce it? I've been pronouncing it ego this whole time! I was wondering why all these psychologists kept going on about frozen waffles. I mean, they are delicious, don't get me wrong, especially with some butter and syrup. But do you know how many years I've wasted chasing the elusive super ego? If I've said it once, I've said it a million times. You're an idiot. The id, ego, and superego are forces within a person's psyche that determine their actions. The id is the brutish, animalistic part of you that wants immediate satisfaction all the time. You're hungry, you need to eat now. You're bored, you need fun now. You're horny, you need me now. You're sick, you need to throw up now. As a baby, you're pure id, crying when you need something until you're given it. Freud said the id followed the pleasure principle at all times regardless of the consequences. As you get older, you learn that you can't always have what you want when you want it, so you develop the ego. The ego finds a realistic way to obtain what the id wants by considering your circumstances and the feelings of other people. You can think of the ego as your more conscious mind. It's the part of your personality that you probably consider you. Makes sense. At this point, I'm 90% ego. I just can't stop eating these things! Moving on, we have the superego. The superego is kind of an idealized form of who you want to be, based on what your society expects of you and what you think is morally right. The superego promotes honesty, loyalty, and equality. We're able to achieve long-term goals by following these rules and delaying our gratification. As much as the superego may sound perfect, though, it's really not. The superego can be too harsh, punishing us for being human and making us feel guilty or shameful for our perfectly natural desires. As you've probably guessed, the id and the superego don't get along too well. Remind you of anyone? Crash, please. We're fully developed people. You can't boil us down to such simplistic 2D caricatures. Anyway, the difference in priorities between the id and the superego causes stress. So to relieve this stress, the ego finds a compromise. Let's say you're sitting in class and you're starving. The id wants to eat right now, but the superego knows that it's rude to eat in class, and so it doesn't let you eat. The ego finds a compromise. You'll buy something from the vending machine and eat it between classes. That way you don't have to wait till lunch. Of course, where this compromise lies depends on the strength of your id and superego. I'm pure id. I'd open up a crinkling bag of Doritos, slurp on my Mountain Dew, and shake M&Ms into my mouth. Who cares what other people think? I'm an animal! Ugh. Can you stop doing that? As gross as Crash is, I'm not much better. I used to obsess over not eating and starve my way through two classes just so the teacher wouldn't tell me off. The ironic thing is, I'd be so hungry I wouldn't even be paying attention to the teacher. You know, I actually made a short film about it using the skills I learnt on Skillshare, our sponsor for this episode. Skillshare is an online learning community where you'll find classes covering everything from animation to writing to photography. If you want to pick up a creative hobby, start your own business, or discover yourself, then Skillshare is the place to do exactly that. Writing about yourself in particular has always been seen as an isolated hobby, but it really doesn't have to be. There's a great class called Creative Personal Writing, Write the Real You, taught by Ashley C. Ford, which lends another perspective on how to explore and present yourself through personal writing. I found the section of drawing on memories to be oddly therapeutic, and really made me more confident in myself, not just as a writer, but as a person. 
That's a pretty awesome reward, considering Skillshare costs just $10 a month for an annual subscription. If you needed any more incentive to join a community of like-minded, creative people, then check out the link in the description of this video. The first thousand people to click the link will get a free trial of Skillshare's premium membership, so you can cruise the classes and see what suits you. Give it a go. You made a film about being hungry in class? BORING! I made a film about lemmings driving motorcycles into volcanoes! Yeah, remind me to call the RSPCA after this. So using Freud's theory of personality, how did Crash and I get to be such different people? Well, you see, this is where the whole perverted sex thing comes in. I've been here the whole time? I meant Freud's psychosexual theory of development, a series of five stages focused on our areas of pleasure that determine certain aspects of our personality. If any of these stages are improperly handled, then it's possible we'll develop problems later on, which Freud called fixations. We begin with the oral stage as newborns. At this point in our life, we get most of our pleasure from breastfeeding, so we tend to think of pleasure in an oral form. Hence, if you have issues with the oral stage, then you develop an oral fixation. For example, if we're weaned too early, we might still crave oral pleasure and resort to gum chewing or overeating when we're older. Naturally, this stage is about learning independence for the first time as the baby is shifted away from relying on its mother. This Freud guy doesn't know anything. I eat lots and chew gum all the time, but mommy still sends me breast milk every week. Oh god, that's disgusting. I think it's about time you switch to formula. Next we have the anal stage, and I dread to think what I'm going to find out about Crash for this one. The anal stage revolves around toilet training, where the child learns increased responsibility and gains confidence from doing something for themselves. Of course, the child isn't alone in this. How well they adapt to this new task relies on their parents' guidance. Freud thought that if your parents were too harsh when you messed up, you would grow up to be anal retentive. That's what it means when someone calls you anal. You're too uptight and fussy. I bet your parents stuck you in the naughty corner every time you pooped in the wrong place. My parents never used the naughty corner. That's just the strategy I used to deal with you when you poop in the wrong place. Conversely, if parents were too lax in disciplining their child when they messed up, they could grow up to become anal expulsive. In other words, slovenly. Thanks for clearing that up. It means messy, all right? Try reading a dictionary sometime. In the third stage, the phallic stage, children discover the difference between the genders with some, uh careful examination. This is easily the most controversial of Freud's proposed stages, especially in his time when the thought of children having remotely sexual thoughts was completely opposed. Some of Freud's most odd theories also revolve around this stage of development, like that theory I mentioned earlier that boys are in love with their mothers. Freud called this the Oedipus Complex after the story of Oedipus, who competed with his father for his mother's love. That's dumb. I'd never fight with dad for mom. There'd be no contest. I watched the man spear a dude out the window. Of course, this salacious theory caught on like wildfire, more for its ability to generate gossip than any scientific legitimacy. And don't worry, Freud didn't leave anyone out. He has a theory for little girls too. Penis envy. Freud thought that girls were jealous of men's penises and spent their whole life pursuing them so they could gain power. Needless to say, if Freud had a podcast today, he'd be absolutely crushed by cancel culture. Cancel culture? I'm up for that! Don't forget who writes your paychecks, buddy. In the fourth stage, the latent stage, the child's sexual thoughts go dormant as they learn to navigate broader society. They meet other children and parents, their teachers, and so on. During this period, the ego and superego develop, and the kid goes through a whole heckin' heap of maturity all at once. Learning how to build relationships is incredibly important, and if an individual gets stuck in this stage, they may find it hard to interact in a socially responsible way. And I can see the crash is tuned out because I stopped talking about sex. What? No, I, I paid attention. Uh, kids navigate the uh, other children, uh, goes through a whole heckin' heap of uh, sex. Clearly, Crash skipped that stage. This stage ends at the beginning of puberty and launches us into the fifth and final stage that we remain in for the rest of our lives, the genital stage. At this stage, the person's libido reawakens, but now with the ego and superego formed. Hopefully. This allows them to start balancing their urges with the realities of good relationships and societal norms. If they've developed well, they'll now be able to take an interest in other people's welfare rather than only satisfying their own needs. But of course, the lifelong war of the id, ego, and superego still rages on as the developed individual tries to make measured decisions. Should I have McDonald's or KFC for breakfast? Why is it always so hard to choose? Now you've probably listened to all these theories and thought back on your life and things have started to slot into place. Oh, that's why I'm like that. Or something along those lines. But before you go too far down that rabbit hole, I just have one small caveat to add to this whole discussion. Freud's theories are pretty well discredited by the modern psychological community. 
Why do you always jump at my head with useless crap? It's not useless, it's just that Freud's theories of personality have one big issue. They're just too vague. It's a little bit like reading a horoscope. If you try to apply the horoscope to your day, you're sure to find some relevance. But that doesn't make them true, or false, or anything, really. They're just unverifiable ideas or guesses. This is the biggest criticism of Freud. His psychoanalysis was kind of a pseudoscience. It tried to encompass all things, but in doing so, made no real testable statements. But since his time, plenty of his ideas have been proven and expanded upon. Earlier, I mentioned how we know that early childhood experiences affect our adult personalities and our unconscious desires can affect our actions. Freud's most unique and enduring legacy is his description of defense mechanisms, techniques we use to protect the ego from the stress of disagreements between the id and the superego. Defense mechanisms, huh? Like when you yell at me so I curl up into a ball and start making noises like an ambulance siren? Exactly. That particular example would be regression, when you revert to how you would act at an earlier stage of development. There are plenty more though. Denial, when you refuse to accept plain reality. Projection, when you feel uncomfortable about your feelings, so you project those feelings onto someone else. Repression, when you unconsciously choose to hide disturbing or traumatic memories. Or you know, how about rationalization, when you try to explain your undesirable actions by using logic that you don't actually agree with. You might say you didn't go to that party because you're too cool for it, but you know full well it's because you borrowed the host's car last week and crashed it into a tree and just don't want to get yelled at. Please don't bring this up. I think I'm more than justified bringing that up as many times as I want. Seriously, I still can't believe you drove my car into the local swimming pool. Don't yell at me! All of this is to say that although Freud had some pretty crazy ideas, his general thought process laid the foundation for modern psychology and psychotherapy. And where would we be without therapy? See you all soon.